Hello everyone, welcome to the Q&A Cafe. We're here at the Georgetown Club in Georgetown and thank you for joining us on YouTube and uh, at home on TV and here in uh, the club. Um, I want, and, and our guest, John Donvin, of course. And if John doesn't mind, um, before I start talking to him about everything, uh, on a sad note, I wanted to take a moment to just remember a man named Jim Kimsey. He was one of the founders of America Online. And uh, to us at the Q&A Cafe, a very special person. I, if we have done almost 400 of these shows now in 15 wow. years, I would say Jim probably came to 250 of them at least. And he was a very loyal patron, loved the show, came no matter what, sometimes just walked in the door and said, who's the guest? Which was the way I like it to be. But uh, he died this week uh, from cancer. He was uh, 76 years old. He loved his white wine. So those of you with white wine or ginger ale, let's just raise a glass to Jim. Thank you. Jim? And now I'll be all tipsy. Um, but but John, uh, speaking of friends, um, you and I have known each other a long time. Right. Uh, we go way back at ABC News, and uh, and while you and I never had the privilege of working together on a particular story, I was always so envious of my colleagues, usually field producers at at Nightline or sometimes this week, who would say. Uh, they were going off somewhere in the world to do a story, and I would like go, oh, okay, I hope it's going to be all right. And they'd say, the correspondent's John Donvan. It's going to be a breeze. They really said that? Oh, my God, every single time. Oh, I wish I knew that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you would have brutalized them? I would have exploited that kindness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, you, you, and I think even for people watching you on the air, the um, it comes across. There is a kind of ease of your job you may not be feeling it but the uh, but the way you report is is inclusive and relaxing it, it's a pleasure to watch you well thank you so Thanks. let me ask this are you still an ABC News correspondent I, I I still have the title ABC News correspondent although since 2011 my relationship with them has been as an outside contributor so not I preserve bad. the title, mm -hmm. um, and I probably do at this point 30 to 45 pieces for them a year. That's good. Um, I do them from wherever I am, including my home studio or yeah. traveling. I've done, I've done, I've, I've literally have done narrations for pieces for them, parked in a car near Logan Airport <laughs> after my son and I were visiting colleges up there and they called me for something and I said I've got to pull over and write something and you know you're so you can be so portable now and I love this and I, I had a microphone with me all the time I narrated into my laptop I hooked it up to my cell phone sent in a narration and it was on the air within about two hours while I tried to to narrate while in the periods between planes flying overhead yeah. so I pulled it off I love so, adapting yeah so I still know. I still do that with ABC yeah but um, another role you have with which I, is where I want to start today, before we get to your book, um, is you are the host of Intelligence Squared. Yeah. Tell us briefly about Intelligence Squared, and then we're going to talk about presidential debates for a moment. Intelligence Squared U.S. is something I do uh, all the time. I love doing it, and it's a program headquartered in New York, but staged in various places around the country, where um, we mount Oxford-style debates mm -hmm. on important issues of the day, and sometimes just interesting issues of the day. Mm -hmm. And we bring in an audience to listen to these debates, and mm -hmm. the audience actually gets the chance to vote on who were, which team won. Yeah. They, they pick the winner, and also they get to ask questions in the middle. And we sell out crowds in Manhattan on nights when there are lots of other things going on. Um, and we take on a range of topics, of foreign policy, domestic policy, finance, but also cultural issues like whether uh, college football should be banned. We've debated things about the art market. We've de we had one debate based on Hannah Rosen's Atlantic article where the motion was men are finished. Turns out, by the vote of the audience, they are, uh, which is bad news. <laughs> Sorry. So um, we've now, um, since the program was launched in 2006, and I joined in 2008, we've put on about 120 debates uh, around the U.S., but mostly in New York, and it's a, deli a delight. So um, it must be crushing for you to watch the debates of this presidential season so far, in particular the Republican debates, which can't even really be called debates, can yeah, they? Yeah, they're not debates. and, and um, 
I've written a few articles about mm -hmm. how they're not debates, and I've given up on this, but for a while I was tweeting that these are not debates, because they're not. They, and I think everybody can see how that's the case, that what they really are are um, dueling press conferences mm -hmm. um, where the, the, the debaters simply don't debate with each other. They don't take on an issue and, and chew it over and, and, and counter one another's detailed views because yeah. nobody's presenting detailed views. It gets to an increasingly debased level, too, Well, as this, we know. this time in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump's uh, personality has really lowered the bar in terms of the quality and civility of the discourse. But the others jumped in. Well, they've, they've ultimately jumped in. Um, you know, and, so uh, and they, I they think didn't they, have to. They, well, they made a calculation that they were going to lose because all of the all of the airtime, all the face time was going to yeah. Trump. It's still, yeah, just it's still ask the John case. Kasich. Yeah, it's still the case because of the, the rule that if your name is mentioned, you get to respond. And these guys keep taking the bait. I mean, recently. Well, he mastered the modern. Con he he took yeah. he yeah. took the modern concept of of news networks hosting the debates and whatever rules they used, and he exploited it. And he knew he was good for ratings. He claims he's good for ratings, and he's right. He's good for ratings. So I was just going to say one of the thing you wrote a Wall, Wall Street Journal piece um, op-ed where you were lamenting the the current state of the debates, and you said that historically, d debates were losing audience. Yeah. And has this brought the audience back, but in the wrong way? This thing that's not called, that are not debates, yes, yes has definitely brought audience back to this format where you see a lot of people on the stage yelling at each other and also jousting with moderators who, who are most of the time trying to catch the candidates out. So that's another dynamic that I think is discouraging, that the, the moderators uh, who are aggressive, who, are in, who intervene, are working to sort of make their news moment by catching the, uh, the candidate. Yeah. And the moderators who are not aggressive uh, and who, s who are more passive, they have a sort of opposite problem. Then the debate just runs off the rails and they get criticized for not intervening enough. Has anybody, do you know whether anybody has tracked um, a debate with a with a um, you know a meter of yes uh, where uh, if the if the TV audience goes away when the debate turns to substance yeah. or if it increases when it just turns to vitriol and name calling I think um, yes there have I've seen uh, years ago at ABC focus I was, group I, I That's was, what I was, I was thinking. part of an experiment where they used focus groups with dials yeah. to watch a debate and. Uh, I was I, I it was a it was a mock debate and I I was the moderator in that case I was very young and I was good a moderator as I am now um, and and in fact the audience gets more passionate as that as that as the atmospherics on stage heat up and you know I, I'm not against a good passionate rousing rousing atmospheric yeah. debate that's really robust and tough and where the candidates are really really going at each other but the question is are you going you're going to be going at at the at, you know the last debate in the innuendos about Donald Trump's genitalia versus what's he going to do about ISIS <laughs> and and the ISIS stuff he doesn't engage in first of all none of the other candidates he mentions really it do. and talks about heads yeah. being chopped off yeah. and 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 so but but I will say it's not the case that you don't learn something from these debates I think we've learned a tremendous amount about who they really are in some sense who they really are mm -hmm. who they are when they really get their backs against the wall mm -hmm. um, how how you know where the, where's the point where they're willing to sell out their their high road stand Marco Rubio tried for a while to stay above the fray mm -hmm. he finally gave up so you saw mm -hmm. where the breaking point came for him mm -hmm. where he ultimately thought he was gonna he was being counted out so he decided to indulge in that yeah we've seen John Kasich hold out longer against that disappear off the side of the stage yes basically. and as a result of that is he disappearing off the side of the stage so it's an unfortunate thing uh, it's not again I'm, I'm all for a fun powerful entertaining engaging debate and mm -hmm. watching guys spat yeah has some of that but ultimately the stakes are so serious that you really truly want to know if this is guy or woman is going to lead, what do they actually think about? What are they? What are their true values? What do they really think? How would they react in a situation? And how do they think under pressure? Which a debate right. could show you if it was done the right way. Uh, and the Democrats have um, really not benefited from the same, uh, you know, uh, audience that the Republicans have attracted. I mean, they. Well, yeah. For partly, I think. Um, O'Malley was a O'Malley was a, was not playing the clown's role at all while he was still in. Yeah. Um, I think Hillary Clinton is more willing to sort of go to the dark side if she feels it's necessary. But nothing like on but, the scale. Of no, and Bernie Sanders hasn't made it necessary. He's been a very very civil, 
respectable ideas yeah. guy. He, now he has his talking points. He recites them relentlessly. That's not actually debate either. Right. But he hasn't. He hasn't wanted to turn it personal. He walked away from the emails thing very, very early. You know, I think if it comes down to Trump and Clinton, we're going to hear about the emails constantly. We will. We will soon have run through the. Um, the primary era debates and then the parties will have their nominees and once they have their nominees it will it will become the official presidential debates which are run by an official commission yeah. um, let's say hypothetically that Trump is the nominee and, and Clinton is the nominee for the Democrats how do they how do you see that going, and what would be your advice as a, as a debate expert well, on we, how they... We, we, our group, Intelligence Squared U.S., has actually been in touch with the Presidential Debate Commission, Good. which, to put it in two sentences, the Presidential Debate Commission was set up by the two major parties several years ago to shape the debates, and both parties have an interest in trying to shape the debates to the advantage of their candidates at the time. Uh, I think they've made more effort in recent years to try to improve the quality of the debates and come up with rules, but they're struggling. They know that people don't really like them. Yeah. Um, the, the, and, and what we've proposed is that we actually do an Oxford-style debate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're going to do that or if they're taking it seriously, but they've gotten back to us. And uh, Yeah, even if you do that, even if that's the ground rules, how do you prevent uh, Donald Trump from going rogue on Ultimately stage? Ultimately, you can't. Ultimately, yeah. you can't. I mean, I, I've had debates where debaters went rather rogue, mm -hmm. not, to the, not to the extreme that Trump has. And in those cases, I've stopped the proceedings. And I've, I've without trying to sound like a school marm, <laughs> I've stopped the proceedings. And I've pointed out that the debaters agreed to certain rules. And yeah. what I do is I channel the audience's Right. Frustration yes. with what's happening yeah. on the stage at the moment. And make uh, them an ally. Yeah. That, that said, I did a debate outside of Intelligence Squared once where um, Charles Krauthammer was one of the debaters and Robert mm -hmm. Reich was the debater. And the, the organizers had great hope for a very high level debate. Mm -hmm. They really wanted to, uh, to hear two well known thinkers, one conservative and one liberal. Mm -hmm. um, argue out something very fundamental about uh, about uh, mm -hmm. the, the role of government. I can't remember exactly what the motion was, but it was a stated motion yeah. along the lines of something like the, f the founding fathers wanted big government or something like that. Um, it was very fundamental. And we had a lot of conversations ahead of time about the ground rules and the expectations of the audience were very, very high that they would really hear how they articulated these thoughts and mm -hmm. these ideas and the values that came out of them. And so the debate ensued, and Krauthammer went first, and uh, he had a, an eight or nine or ten minute opening segment. Mm -hmm. And then it was to go to Robert Reich, and I was sitting between them, and Krauthammer went through his thing, and um, actually Reich went first, sorry, Reich went first. He, the, the time ran out, I said, uh, Mr. Reich, your time is up. He stopped. We went to Krauthammer. Krauthammer opened a little book that I could see of little one-line zingers mm -hmm. that was so superficial mm -hmm. and so designed to be cutesy and Fox Newsy, he, he, he <laughs> totally didn't engage with what Reich had just said. It yeah. was very disappointing. And then his time limit was hit. And I said, Mr. Krauthammer, your time is up. And he was shocked mm -hmm. that I told him that. And he looked up to the audience and he said, you don't want this guy cutting me off, do you? Mm -hmm. And this whole, all of his fans in the audience went, ah! <laughs> and, and at that moment, the, the, the evening from the point of view of a substantive debate was ruined. And after a while, Reich started to play by the same mm -hmm. way that Krauthammer had. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have the authority in that setting that I do with the Intelligence Squared world, where, where for some reason, when I put my foot down, I've, I've never yet not succeeded in, well, in steering things. Well, they're coming there because they, they want the real debate. Is Yeah, I think the guess. audience selects itself because they know that's what we're going to do there. Yeah. Um, well, it's very interesting. And I'm glad that you gave us a few moments just to talk about that. But we're really here today to talk about your new book, your co-author um, with uh, Karen Zucker. And a different key, the story of autism. Yep. We already shot it, so I'm just showing the audience here. It is a... It's a big book. It is a big book. Um, why did you do it? Why did you write a book about autism? Um, partly I did it for Karen, who's a colleague of mine at ABC. Mm -hmm. Back in the 90s, I worked overseas for many years. 
for about 13 years, and I came back to ABC in New York in the 90s. And um, I, I was newly married to uh, the woman I'm still married to, mm -hmm. Dr. Renit Mishuri, who at that time was not a doctor, but she was thinking of going into medicine, and mm -hmm. she now has. And Renit has a brother in Israel, where she's from, who is profoundly affected by autism. He cannot speak, and he cannot live independently. Um, and he's about 48, 49 years old now, mm -hmm. and he lives in a very protected environment. Her mother was a very big activist that changed the world for people with autism in Israel. And Karen was a producer whom I didn't know very well, but uh, when I came back from overseas and went to ABC News in New York, she and I were often put together to work on stories. I was the correspondent, she was the producer. And we went out on a bunch of different, you know, covered civil rights, things mm -hmm. like that, general assignment. Mm -hmm. um, when our, when, when Renit became pregnant with our first son, somebody threw us a party f celebrating his birth in advance. And Karen was invited, and she brought along her little boy named Mickey, who at that time was two years old. Mm -hmm. And the party r went on, and sort of pe people were dancing and drinking, and Mickey was running around, and Karen was chasing him around. He's a toddler. And that night, when we got home, Renit said, does Karen know that her son Mickey has autism? And I said, she's wow. never said anything, and he doesn't have autism. And she said, well, I grew up with autism, and I think he does. And I didn't say anything to Karen. But two months later, he was diagnosed with autism. And she... Um, and I'm sure you've since told her this story. I've since told her the story, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, she says, you should have told me. Why didn't you tell me? Who knows? And I said, because I didn't think he did, and how can I... And she said, you should have. And I said, well, we, we disagree on that. But um, she immediately had to start what parents have to do nowadays when their kids kids are diagnosed with autism is that they they need to sort of go into this emergency mode and try to get them uh, a kind of treatment and the, the treatment that's used in most places now is called apl applied behavior analysis right. it's ABA. very ABA it's very expensive it's very intensive it, it requires the child being seen by somebody for 40 hours a week usually done in the home it costs hundreds of th thousands of dollars over several years about 40 to 50 to 80 thousand dollars a year and, um, and how much, if any, is covered by insurance? Uh, it depends on the state. Back when she was doing it, none of it was covered by insurance. Yeah. And um, so she had to leave her full-time job to mm -hmm. do that, and she started working part-time. Story so, told many times yes, over by. Yes, yes. Yeah. And she and I, uh, that cut back on our partnership as professionals, but she, um, she was telling me about what her life was like now, and I said, why don't we do a story about a day in the life of your son, what that's like. And she said, um, because I'm a producer, I don't want to be on television. I'm, that's not what I'm comfortable with. But she said, why don't we find somebody else to do it? And so we, uh, in the year 2000, we spent six months shooting a story about uh, two boys who were being uh, treated with ABA therapy. Mm -hmm. And one of them had had a remarkable progress, and the other not so were remarkable. Were they brothers? No, they were different families. Yeah. yeah. And um, when we first approached ABC to put it on the air, initially we got uh, sort of a blank wall on it. They'd never heard of autism. They didn't see what its relevance would be, that it was too narrow a yeah. topic, which sounds remarkable now because it's so talked about today. Mm -hmm. But this was before the vaccine thing really got going and alerted more people to, mm -hmm. to be, in that case, afraid of autism unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but Nightline, always being somewhat visionary, uh, agreed yeah, to put yeah. the story on. And after that, uh, we were off to the races and we started, and we kind of made autism a beat. Mm -hmm. And it actually got a label for a time. It was called Echoes of Autism. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie Gibson, uh, when he took over the anchor chair, was very behind it. Um, and Ted Koppel was very behind it. And um, we started doing a series of stories, uh, several dozen, over a period of five or six years that didn't look at autism the way that the way that the media those days treated autism was sort of everybody's rain man and you know kids who can do remarkable math tricks or there were a lot of stories about miracle cures this chemical compound this there was one about this woman in New York said if you hug your child tightly enough yeah, well the, hugging therapy it was and that, that's you know the 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 history that's documented in your book is is fascinating <coughs> um, let me so, we so we decided to do a book, to answer your right. question. No, I can we see where that was going, that you yeah. guys were already on this path, yeah. and, and the book makes sense. But I'd, I'd like to ask you a few fundamental questions, because I think for um, a lot of people, I mean, we're all touched by autism, I believe. I mean, I, I don't have an immediate family member, but I have a close friend who has a grandson. Um, it's around. 
I don't think I know a lot about it, so this was very interesting, but, but for those people who may not, um, is, it, is, it, is it the medical mystery or one of the medical mysteries of our time? Well, I would say it's one, because there's, you know, there's so many others. Um, the brain itself is full of mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting is whether we can even say it, whether we're really just talking about well, one thing or not. What does spectrum mean? The, yeah, the spectrum idea of autism is relatively new. It's a, about 15 to 20 years old. Um, and uh, depending on who you are, it's either controversial or it's a fact of life. Uh, yeah. We take the point of view that the spectrum is uh, probably not necessarily a, a fact of life. It's a way that we've decided to look at autism. And autism has always been a thing defined by the way we decide to look at it. And that's because autism is not a condition that has a, a, a biomarker. There's no, there's no cheek swab for it. Is it a it. disorder, a disability? What is it, how is it classified It's a medically? disorder that in some people relates to a disability depending on how profound how profound the Where they are. are on the spectrum. Yes, yes. And so there are people who nowadays have the label autistic who are who are who have PhDs and are, you know, teaching at MIT, uh, or I have a friend who who's teaching at William and Mary, who is on the autism spectrum. And that's this is what's called high functioning, correct? Is that uh, the accurate term? It depends term? on who you talk to. Some people object to the term high functioning okay. because there's a whole politics of identity right. now. And some people say high functioning is insulting because uh, who are you to judge what's high and low? So, but that's a whole. Well, because autism is fraught with politics. Boy, is autism. I mean, fraught the whole with story politics. of autism yes. is you know every yeah. every page is uh, politics, which you know, and and that's another thing. Um, there is so there's so much out there. I mean, not only are there books, but uh, there are podcasts. There's even. There's even podcasts about the comedy of autism. Yeah. And uh, where, where does your book fit in? Who is your book for? Our book is about the lives and the struggles and the battles and the triumphs and some of the defeats mm -hmm. of people who live with autism and their families over 75 years as those families struggle to make a place in the world for their kids. But it's for people who don't know anything about autism to understand what those families have gone through, mm -hmm. to understand that all of us, all of us have always played a role in the experiences that those families have, whether we know it or not, mm -hmm. to understand that all of us have a role in making life better by being more inclusive. There's a story we tell near the end of the book about a, a scene that took place on a bus. Oh, I wanted to save that. All right, let's save it. Save it, because I do, I do want to, I, I, it's a great story. All right, but it will And it's we'll illustrative back. of it gets everything. To the, it gets to the point of who this book is for. Yeah, so let me do a few more fundamentals. Um, okay. Um, how is it diagnosed? Is it, can it be clinically diagnosed? How early can it be it diagnosed? Well, as I was saying before, it cannot be diagnosed by a blood test. It's diagnosed by somebody who is considered an expert by training who observes an individual's behaviors and matches those behaviors against a checklist based on a definition of what are, autism are is. Are pediatricians the front line? Nowadays they're becoming the front line. I would say that 15 years ago most pediatricians were taught nothing about autism. Some psychiatrists were, some neurologists were, yeah. some educators were. It was sort of all over the place. But today, I would say in 2016, 17, 18, we're going to see pediatricians getting much more training in it, and family, family doctors as well, mm -hmm. um, because it's, it often, it, it's often been thought of as a thing that affects children, even though, of course, the children grow up. Uh, are, there ages, are there ages within which it's typically... Um, identified? Yeah, it, it's getting younger and younger. It used to be four or five or six. It's getting to be now as young as two years Is old. Is that our sophistication though as we well, become? It's well, because, it's because it's a social condition and, mm -hmm. and the point at which it becomes obvious that a child is not socially the same as other people his age, mm -hmm. that you need to, you, uh, for, for, it, you wouldn't see that until maybe the child was old enough. You're waiting for a milestone mm -hmm. and then the doesn't, child doesn't hit the milestone or you see the child in company with other children. That's how Karen's son was diagnosed. Karen thought their son was a genius. He was, he was uh, talking and mimicking sentences yeah, when he was a year funny. old and they they thought he was really advanced um, but then they went to a play group and they were watching through a one-way mirror 
And the teacher in the playgroup said, okay, children, come over now. We're all going to sit down and have milk and cookie. And, and Karen and her husband looked at each other and said, what is that teacher thinking? Those kids will never sit down when she tells them to. In fact, all of the kids went and sat down. And her son went to the other corner and started taking his clothes off. And that's, that was the day that they were mm -hmm. called in mm -hmm. to be told there's something about your son. So, so they didn't see it. So you need to hit a certain age. But that age is getting lower and lower because new tests are being developed where you can look at tracking eye movements and things like that that are thought to perhaps mm -hmm. be early indicators. Is it evenly distributed um, geographically among the sexes, among races and ethnicities? Really important question and hard to answer. And again, what is it? Depends on what we're talking about. Well, let's say the spectrum, if that, whatever is easiest sure. for you well, to... The reason this is an important question is that the, mm -hmm. the, the definition has changed many, 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 many times over the years. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're looking for has changed many times over the years. But let's, f let's pick a moment in time. Let's pick today. Mm -hmm. We have a working definition. It's in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual published by the American Psychological Association. That's what most people use as the definition. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could look at that definition and, and see out there what's the pattern. Well, the pattern is that there's more autism in New Jersey than there is in Mississippi, for example. Mm -hmm. There's more autism in white communities than there is in black communities, for example. There's more autism in girls, in boys, than there is in girls, for example. We don't know that those are actually facts or if those have to do with how we're looking. Mm -hmm. The fact is New Jersey is a state that offers much more help to families with autism than Mississippi does. New Jersey has many more pediatricians mm -hmm. trained to look for autism and to do something about it than Mississippi does. So when you start looking for a condition, you're going to find it. Mm -hmm. My wife said this is... Or people are going to move there. Exactly. To benefit I, from... New Jersey has... People are moving to New Jersey. The state that used to be was North Carolina back mm -hmm. in the 1970s was the first state to offer statewide su support for autism. New Jersey is a place that people are going to. So, yes, of course, their rates go up. Mississippi, they're not counting it. And, uh, and the other thing is um, that the socioeconomic factor well-off communities that have centers that look for and treat autism exist in white communities, mm -hmm. well-off communities, not in minority communities. So then on the question of boys and girls, far more complicated. From the beginning, uh, it's always been the case that there are four times as many boys as girls with autism mm -hmm. since 1938. It's always been the case. And sometimes people have thought, well, maybe there's a clue in that. Maybe there's something about being male that, or maybe there's something about being female that protects you against autism, or mm -hmm. something about male that enhances the odds. But there's another school of thought that says it presents differently in girls. We just don't know how to look for it in the right way. We don't know how to see it. Girls are socialized differently from boys. I was going to say, could it be because they develop differently? Yes, and they're, and they're also scolded more than boys to behave. They get much more, as little girls, much more don't do that, don't do that, don't do that than boys do. Mm -hmm. And there's some teaching in that don't do that, that ultimately maybe they comply. And so maybe it doesn't show up in girls in the same degree. So it's a very murky, it's a great question, and of, uh, whether it's different in different groups. Our, our thought in the book is that it, it's, it's the same in everybody that these, that we just not The research it. just has to catch up. Catch up. What about yeah. geographically? Is it, is it in Russia? Is it in China? Is it in Latin America? Is it in England? Is it in France? It, it's, it's, it's more in English speaking countries than in non English speaking countries, which I think again has to do with who's looking for it, who has the idea of it. In other cultures, it's considered different things. Karen went to South Africa and traveled uh, with some, some uh, uh, both white and black autism experts from the big cities out yeah. into the bush. And out in the bush, they're trying to educate people that what they think is demonic possession is actually autism. And she, she sat down with a sort of spiritual healer, what used to be called a witch doctor, mm -hmm. very benevolent one, who was working to, with, with families to try to purge the evil spirits that caused autism. And, and that, that the one that she spent time with was very benevolent, but she had this whole shelf full of all of these ground up rhinoceros horns, things like that, um, that she was doing to do a sort of religious ceremony to yeah. purge autism from the family. But in some cases, they were pouring bleach into children's ears and making them drink bleach as a form of exorcism. The Karen didn't see that. Yeah. Where on the other hand, in Jerusalem, there was a belief among some extreme Orthodox Jewish sects that autism was divine inspiration, that it was divine visitation. And they would hold seances where a, the community would surround or put on stage an autistic boy or girl mm -hmm. and ask questions of God 
through the child with a with a sort of medium inter. And so right. in different cultures, yeah, in it some looks way kind of demonic. But, you know, but it's but, a very different thing in different places. And 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 this is all in your book. But you know, we're, we're, we can't we we can't be all high and mighty with countries that are still way back there because even in our own um, progression with autism. We have our dark ages, and it's interesting that a lot of people think of Geraldo Rivera as just this uh, bombastic TV correspondent, but he actually made his name in journalism back in the 70s right. for a story he did on Willowbrook, uh, which was an institution in New York, and it was it. I think it symbolizes the. I mean, not every not every child in Willowbrook was autistic, but. Um, it just shows, uh, he, well, you, you talk about it. You talk about the well, story that he did, why he's in your book. Geraldo Rivera's in our book, briefly but very positively, because when he was a very young reporter, he had been a lawyer, then he became a reporter, and he broke into the Willowbrook uh, State School, which was on Staten Island, and, and, and revealed uh, horrible scenes of the way the children and adults who were living in this place by the hundreds and hundreds yeah. were being treated, and many, many of them had autism. And there were many places like this across the country. Interestingly, too, other reporters had been breaking into these places for 80 years. We found the New York Times account of a reporter who went into an institution in 1898 and exposed the scandal of the mistreatment, the choking, the nakedness, people rolling in their own excrement, living in their own excrement. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it was forgotten. And then we saw in 1910 a reporter did it again. In 1940, in the 1960s, Geraldo, they didn't have television. They didn't have television, <laughs> and, Her and they didn't have Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. Geraldo Rivera came up with a very powerful line. He said, "I can tell you what it looks like, and I can tell you what it sounds like, but I can't tell you what it smells like." It was one of the most powerful lines, and it finally helped break the hold of institutions. Why institutions? Because parents who had children with autism who were diagnosed in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s mm -hmm. were told two things relentlessly. One was, you've got to institutionalize the child for life and forget the child, try to forget the child, move on with your own life. Dr. Spock recommended that in his 1948 edition. On page fi 548, he said, when a child is born and it's obviously got some sort of mental condition, he was thinking mostly about Down syndrome, yeah. immediately the child should be removed from the parents and put into institutional care and they should be counseled to forget the child. And then the following edition, he said, the, the, uh, the mother may resist this, so have the conversation with the father. Oh, the, the, the stigma on mothers in the story well, that's the of thing. autism yeah. is uh, fascinating. Uh, that uh, what were the, what, what, Bruno Bettelheim, right? Who uh, another name that is in your book, and and Bruno Bettelheim, probably in the era of Dr. Spock, you know, was kind of a uh, a Dr. Phil of his time. But he was one of these, uh, you know, trusted authorities on, on how to raise your child, and he had what now would be viewed as a very, you know, a destructive and uninformed view of autism. But his. <laughs> He was blaming the mother, right? Well, that was the second thing that mothers were told when they brought their children. Institutionalize him. And by the way, this is your fault. Yeah. Your child has autism yeah. because you did not show love in his first days of life. Mm -hmm. And he withdrew as a defense mechanism into this world. You did something wrong. And then they were told, if they had enough money, they were told, you need to get immediately into intensive psychoanalysis to try to discover what you did yeah. so that you can try to reverse it and maybe save your child. And so uh, we, Karen again spent hours with two women who lived through this period. No, they're now in their late 70s, early 80s. Their children are in their 40s or 50s, mm -hmm. um, who were still ashamed. They, oh, well, that, you they, know, they, they still mean, felt shame, even primal. though they, they, knew, they, knew that it, that they knew the idea had been killed off, but they still felt some level of shame. Even today, and in, in some of the new research into whether, and I don't know if this is a big field of research or a small or how controversial it is, you can tell us, that mothers are stigmatized again as to whether they take antidepressants while they're pregnant and whether that may play a role. Well, there, there are all kinds of, first of all, the, the Where do we age begin? of the father is another thing that's being considered. 
um, Karen has said that she knows she didn't cause her child's autism, but she's always guilty about whether she did something. She's, she's thought about it a because lot. Because the absence of knowing yes. allows all kinds of, well, and that, so, you know, I think perhaps, and you already mentioned it, the controversy that has drawn the most attention is the whole issue of vaccines. What, what, is, what is it, th thimerosal? Th is thimerosal it? was the preservative used in most vaccines that was based on mercury. And, and these are the vaccines for measles, mumps, and No, measles, mumps, that's and rubella a different okay. was a different So we're thing. talking about two different vaccines, but we're still talking about vaccines. Two, two different vaccine theory, two issues. different compounds, two different vaccine issues. Yeah. So, um, but, but, but in both cases, debunked? In both cases, debunked, yeah, yeah. clearly. Yeah. And, you know, the but, question but wasn't that went the, on for a long time. The question was worth asking when it first was raised in the late 90s. Yeah. Because three things. One is that it had never been examined before. Number two, there, it was discovered that children were getting more vaccines combined in a short period of their early life than they had before the mm -hmm. 1990s. Um, and number three, a lot of parents reported seeing their children develop normally and then go backwards, stop to, start to lose language and start to slip into this world that people call the autistic world. Mm -hmm. So it was worth asking and it hadn't been answered. But then, the, the, then it was answered. The large studies were done repeatedly that put, put to rest the idea that, that there's been a, 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 the increase in vaccines was correlated with an increase in autism. And, and again, the reasons for that, are, there are all so many other reasons for seeing an yeah. increase in autism, like we're, the New Jersey effect we were just talking about yeah. before. It, it's interesting too that, you know, um, is Autism Speaks the most prominent organization? Today it is, yeah. And yet, all the arguments, controversies, and debates seems to run like a thread to the whole story of Autism Speaks, its positions, the people involved in it, what their agendas were. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's, Autism Speaks, if you're not in the autism world, you don't know this, but Autism Speaks has so many enemies inside the autism world yeah. because autism politics are just so fraught. Yeah. What, how did Autism Speak start the, the rights? Bob and Suzanne Wright, our grandparents. NBC. An NBC executive, mm -hmm. grandparents of a son named Christian who is severely, severely impaired. Um, and and they, took, they took their enormous power and put they it. They took their power and they looked around the landscape and they said, you know, there's so many people arguing in, about autism. Let's form one big organization that pulls everybody together mm -hmm. and get everybody on the same page and we'll do research and, and provide services and try to attract funding. And they did attract a lot of the funding in the beginning. Uh, but where they failed, and it's not, it, it, they're, they're, it was an impossible mission, where they failed was the pulling everybody together yeah. part. Um, the vaccine argument was one that split them very early on because there were people who said, well, Autism Speaks needs to be focusing on vaccines. And there were other people saying, stop focusing on vaccines. The question's been answered and it's a waste of time. And, and that actually turned into a family argument because their daughter, the mother of their grandson, mm -hmm. became quite certain that probably she thought vaccines, vaccines. Had, had injured her son. And, and then there's the whole issue of who speaks for autistic people. And there are, because of the spectrum concept now, there are many, many people, as I mentioned before, um, PhD holders and other successful mm -hmm. people in life who identify as autistic, who, who dramatically resent the idea that autism needs to be cured. From their point of view, you can understand it. They say, this, needs is, to be who, treated. this is who I treated. Coped with. Well, they, they do think, they do acknowledge that autistic people may need support, mm -hmm. but they say that what's wrong with being autistic, autistic if it's not diminishing your life's quality. So, so they really resist the Which idea. Which is a positive attitude. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there are people whose autistic traits are like my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law spent his youth tr like biting through his wrist down to the bone, banging mm -hmm. his head against mm -hmm. the wall, mm -hmm. had to wear diapers until w way late. And there are treatments that try to curb the all of those behaviors. The agony for the families is unmeasurable. And, and the people at the other end, so, not all by any means, by the way, but there's a, some extremists at this mm -hmm. end who argue that, no, 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 those are his autistic expressions. And, and they argue against trying to cure autism or trying to treat those symptoms to go away. And so the Autism Speaks has been caught up in that yeah. battle as well. You mentioned that they have enemies. Does your book have enemies? I mean, have yeah, yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Definitely. Because? Because we tell both sides of the story on a number of issues, and in 
autism politics, people don't want the other side of the story told. So it's, it'd probably be impossible to write a book that wouldn't have enemies. We tried as hard as we could by yeah. being fair, by telling both sides of the story, but some people don't want to hear the other side laid out. Yeah. Uh, and this is what happens in any situation where there's an absence of knowledge and education, and the agony all You're falls totally to the right family. On. That's totally it. And, That's totally it. And it will be that. Um, tell the story about the bus. So. Um, it's a story we tell near the end of the book yeah, because yeah. we want to wrap up what our point is. And, and you do that well. Um, it's something that happened on a bus in New Jersey in 2007, town of Caldwell. And there was a young boy, a young man rather, he was on the verge of manhood, looked like a man, sitting alone on the front seat of the bus. Public bus, public, public bus. transportation. He had been trying, he had been getting lessons in how to use transportation mm -hmm. for many weeks, taking that same bus on the same route. In fact, in the back of the bus there was a teacher who was, had been working with him, who was listening. Was they, were. One, they were both wearing Bluetooth headsets. Mm -hmm. But at, by this time, the teacher had moved to the back of the bus so the young man could be by himself. And if he needed, the teacher would whisper things to him through his headset, you know, encouraging him, good job, keep going. Well, two guys get on the bus who didn't know this was going on. And they sit down behind the young guy. And the young guy, who didn't have language, starts making some noises. And he starts rocking in his seat, and he starts mm -hmm. flipping his fingers in front of his face. That's a, 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 a trait called stimming. It's very, very common. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing wrong with it. But he, to the guys behind him. But if him, you don't know what it is. If you don't know what it is, to the guys behind him, they found that bothersome and offensive. And they started to harass him. And they leaned into him, and they started kind of yelling at him, sort of saying, hey, you know, cut that out. What's yeah. your problem, man? And, and just at that moment, the teacher in the back said, uh-oh, I've got to intervene. And he stood up to walk to the front of the bus. But before he got there, another passenger stood up who had been on the, the bus all of these weeks, too, and had seen what was going on. He stood up, and he walks up to these two guys who are bullying the young man. And he says, what's his problem? He's got autism. What's your problem? How about you shut up and back off from this guy? And in that moment, the whole bus unified behind the guy who stood up against the bullies and turned against the bullies. And, and all, they were all there for that moment to that young man with mm -hmm. autism. They all had his back. And when you ask who is our book for, our book is for all the passengers on the bus yeah. who maybe don't know anything about autism, mm -hmm. but maybe if they know a little bit, if they know the story, they'll become the guy who stood up and have the back and of that guy. recognizes it and isn't threatened by it. Exactly, not be mm -hmm. threatened by it. Because so what if he's doing that? Yeah. So yeah. that's. That's we all, we all, we all learn. We all learn to coexist. Um, we only have a few minutes left, and while I know we could talk about this forever, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about with sure. you, and that's your, and that's your life and storytelling, um, uh, because uh, <laughs> John is a marvelous storyteller. And what is the group that you work with? St oh, story? uh, it's, it's called Story District. Story District. And it is literally a stage show where people get together and they, you tell a story. And yeah. I, I, John very sweetly tried to involve me in it once, and I was, I was a miserable failure. But no, you're not done. I'm not okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Yes. But um, what is, what is the, what is it, and what's the appeal to you? Because there might be other people here in Washington who want to do it. Story District puts on shows around the city, run by a, a great storyteller herself named Amy Sedman. She's been doing it for years. She, there's a club uh, over in uh, north east, north mm -hmm. northwest near mm -hmm. the capital, um, and 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 amateur storytellers get up on a stage and and tell stories from their lives for about 15 minutes. Well, right? no, for 20? about seven minutes. Seven minutes. And um, that was one problem. You had a 15 minute story and you <laughs> needed to compress. You know what? It's hard. It's hard to get it. It's hard to get. Well, it this down. is this is because see, it is it is a craft. It's yeah. it's not. But they'll just, teach you. They'll work right. With you. They they will they will train you. And I, I stumbled into it. A friend told me about it, and I kind of couldn't, didn't get what it was. And I went along to this club one night. It's once a month, and uh, everybody's you know, at the bar and everything. And people get up and they start telling. There's always a theme. The theme could be, you know, it's better to win than to lose, or it could be, uh, don't give up, or, or there's always a theme. And I was looking at some they've got or just had or coming up. One of them's True Detective, yeah, or yeah. Uh, you know, there, there is a theme. But so it's the very loosely applied. Right. And people get up and they tell stories from their lives in seven minutes. 
that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And somehow you see a transformation take place in the story. But the, the range of people, there were, yes, there were a few actors, but there were also like Capitol Hill staffers. There were people who worked in nonprofits. There were, there was, uh, there were people who, who were retired and just mm -hmm. had come along and told the story. There's one beautiful story a guy told who was 75 years old about, about how he, he didn't know how to swim, but he was a terrible athlete. So. He signed up for the school swim team. Oh, he was a diver they, for the diving team, and he didn't know how to dive. And, and he didn't tell anybody, and he didn't go to any practices. And the day of the competition, he jumped off the board and did a terrible belly flop. And he was so ashamed. But at the end of the day, he got scored one point on a score of one to 10. ten? At the end of the day, his team by, won by one point. <laughs> and so, and so he, he, was, was he was the one. It was, it was a beautiful story. And who, who would have ever have heard it? So I just got drawn into that. And, and the one I heard you tell a story about your father uh, on stage, and then I heard you tell a story about your children and a and a, a concert at Verizon Center. Oh, was yeah. it Verizon? It was in New York. Actually. New York. Yeah. It was an outdoor concert. It was with, at Central Park with, with One Direction. One Direction, right? Which was and how my daughter needed me badly to get her tickets, and but but then she didn't want. Once I got her the tickets and had to escort her to New York, she she didn't want wanted me, you to stay she very wanted, much. She didn't in the want background. me around her friends, so it was like how to be how resolve to be there that. and not be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the appeal is um, it's scary as hell. It's uh, it is a high diving board. Um, the audiences are so the audiences are rooting for you. It is really safe. There, you know, if you forget if you forget your, your line, line, you're going to hear somebody in the audience say, "Don't worry, keep going. We're here. Don't worry." And and it's um, well, I think it's wonderful. And it's, if you haven't been, you should yeah, do it's, it. It's they, can, they can do it right here. Yeah. Um, our time is up, but, oh, bef okay. but before we uh, say goodbye, I just want to wish you happy birthday. And there's can I say one thing? Yes. When I was writing my book, it took seven years. I had three fantasies. One was to speak at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, which yeah. I did. The Done. other was to hit the New York Times bestseller list, which I did. <laughs> and the third one was Q&A Cafe. Oh my god. It well, was. It thank was. You. Thank, so thank you. Thank you very much. You're a doll. Thank you, everyone. See you at the next one. Happy birthday. Thank you.